O fragrance, O fragrance, wherefore art thou, O fragrance? Hello, my friends. You're tuned in to the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson, from the studios of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. A rose by any other name, as Juliet would say, Stacy. Boy, the quest, the seeking of the elusive flowers that are fragrant, it never ends. No, because uh, you can never have enough. Exactly. It's one of my favorite, favorite things about gardening. It truly is extraordinary. Well, of course, we as people, perfumers, and pollinators love the beautiful scent of flowers. Uh, Fragrance is just a hot button in gardening interest. And, um, and so today we talk about fragrance. It's, and fragrance, Stacy, to me is debatable. I, when I think about fragrance, I think about, you know, with my experience, people reacting to paper white narcissus or ornamental pears. You know, it's interesting how some people think, hey, that smells beautiful. And other people think that smells like ammonia, mothballs, that smells terrible. You know, it's, it's, it's debatable. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because we were having an inter-office conversation about paper whites Uh and Adriana, our producer, had never smelled them. And then we had a visitor to the office drop off a paper white kit and we gave it to Adriana (laughs) and we said, plant these up and let us know where you fall on the fragrance of paper white question. Um, Most of us do not care for it and I am firmly in the do not care for it camp. Mm. Yeah. But there was a few people who were like, oh, I love it. And you, you know, I'm actually very into perfumes in general. I'm very interested in them and collect them. And there are actually paper white based commercially produced perfumes, if yes. you can believe that. So there's obviously an audience out there. Again, debatable. It's very, very interesting. I guess you could say that fragrance is complicated. It is complicated. It's variable. Just like the, the taste of honey. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about the honeybees and pollination and their ability to scent and how important scents was or, or, or are. And, uh, you know, when you taste honey, uh, you know, you can taste whether it's red maple or goldenrod or dandelion. Each is distinctive. And uh, I think that's what, makes, uh, that's what makes it so much fun. It really is. And, you know, there's, it's not just that everything is distinctive, but everything is really perceived by different people different ways. And one thing that we do very often around here at the office at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs is if we have a fragrant flower, you know, we'll ask a bunch of different people here, what does this smell like to you? And everybody describes it differently. And I don't know if that's a matter of people experiencing it differently, but a great example is sweet shrub, Kelly Canthus. Okay. That is a plant that everybody describes is smelling different. I've heard everything from bubble gum to rotten bananas <laughs> to apple cider uh, to people who say, I don't smell a thing. And, you know, it's, and I think that's what makes it so great. It's, you know, when people read a plant description or hear us talk about fragrant plants on, on air here, um, you know, they really need to smell those things themselves because that's the only way you can truly capture a fragrance. It's impossible. You no, know, you can liken it to something else that's fragrant. People might say, oh, you know, this clethora. Or summer sweet smells like vanilla, and you know what vanilla smells like, so you can make that connection. Right, right. But overall, trying to describe a fragrance without referencing something else that you're familiar with as a fragrance, impossible. And that's the amazing thing about fragrance and fragrance with flowers or fragrance in general, is that it invokes memories. It invokes, uh, it evokes uh, autobiographical. Uh, autobiographical? Boy, Thank you. See, Stacy always comes to my rescue. Uh, I'm reading something here from a psychologist. Autobiographical memories and have no doubt fragrance is imprinted on your mind. You know, I've read uh, where these fragrances are imprinted on your mind, maybe from the age of five or a young age. Think about picking some lilacs in spring for your mom on Mother's Day. Right. Absolutely. For me, that early fragrance memory and really the and I've said this when I do talks, my one of my earliest garden memories is my grandmother had a bed of lily of the valley next to her garage. And I was about three years old and she showed me them and, you know, had me smell them and I fell in love immediately. And she said, you can pick as many as you want. And, you know, to a three year old, that was like amazing. And 
you know, sliding the, yeah. the stem of the lily in the valley out of that leaf sheath is still one of my absolute favorite things to do. And every single time I do it between the smell and the action, I'm right back there with my grandma in Redford, Michigan, three years old. So it's, it's so amazing. It's There's really nothing else, no other scent that so completely takes you back to where you first experienced it. The best way to describe it is it is auto... Biographical. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, though. You know, if you think about the scent of pine at Christmas time, or or you walk into a bakery and you think about birthdays past, uh, anything like that. You know, it's it's amazing how fragrance can uh, just evoke these these many memories that we have. Now, some plants, for the sake of fragrance, uh, Stacy on the top of my list has got to be viburnums. Uh, you know, anybody can argue that, uh, but like Korean spice, spice baby, or spice girl. Wow, the fragrance, unreal. Those do smell absolutely delicious, but you know, we can't do our, our listeners a disservice here and not warn them that some viburnums do not smell quite so delightful. Correct. So you don't necessarily want to go stick in your nose in a viburnum without knowing what you are uh, potentially in store for. There are some, like Rick mentioned, the Korean spice that are delightfully fragrant, but there are a number that are uh, kindly described as hound dog. Oh, yeah. That's, cat, that's a nice way litter. of putting it. <laughs> cat litter. <laughs> so, you know, uh, don't just stick your nose in them. Give it a little waft, like back in chemistry class first, before you, you get in closer when it comes to viburnums. Well, with all of this, you have to have a sense of humor, right? So take that approach. Now, here we're talking about Stacy Carlisii. Is that how you would pronounce that's it? That's how you pronounce it, yeah. Okay, Korean spice. Uh, lavender, of course, is tops on mm. the list. Heliotrope. A lot of people refer to it as cherry pie flour because in the heat of summer, it does smell like a cherry pie that's just been pulled out of the oven. Yeah, it's a very, very nice fragrance. It also has a strong vanilla suggestion in it as well. And with uh, master perfumers, of course, the rose is the basis of everything. And with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs uh, a few years ago, I was so excited, Stacy, when uh, At Last Rose came along. Uh, just a tremendous rose, so great to grow in the landscape, but had that old-fashioned fragrance. It does. And, you know, we have... Uh, so it was interesting, you were talking at the beginning of the show about how people are missing fragrance and searching for fragrance. And that's really what happened with roses, is, you know, the first disease-resistant roses came out and everyone said, oh, these are so great. They don't ever get disease. They flower nonstop. But then they started saying, this is nice, but I really miss the fragrance. That was one of the things I loved about roses. So as uh, plant breeders have been able to, you know, kind of tie down the disease resistance, they've been able to work more with breeding and fragrance. And so that's what we're working with now with the Reminiscent Rose Series, which is going to be new at garden centers for the first time this year. Fantastic. Big old-fashioned flowers with oh. true old-fashioned fragrance. And another one, you just have to smell to believe. Mm. Love it. Love it. Of course, on the list are herbs like basil mm. for me, jasmine. I remember working in the garden center industry and we'd order foliage plants uh, from the south and the jasmine that were packed in these cardboard boxes. When we'd open up the box, you'd practically fall over from the fragrance of jasmine. Vitex. I love vitex as a shrub in our in our landscapes. And Stacy, that one, I know this is odd, but in summertime, it smells to me like Vicks VapoRub. Oh, I have not noticed that, but yeah. I will definitely be uh, looking out for that this season. <laughs> Clethro Summer Sweet Gardenias have to be oh, on the list. Amazing. Just <laughs> an, such an incredible fragrance. And last week's show, we talked about Budlia Miss Molly, right? Yep. Yeah. And you know what one of my favorite ones that just doesn't get enough credit What's that? Linden. Linden trees. Oh, Tilia. I very mean, good. You know, not only are they just powerfully fragrant, and of course they're a, a mature tree, so just, you know, thousands and thousands of flowers, but they bloom in that mid to late June time frame where it's starting to get really warm and humid, and they just fill the air in the most magical way. <laughs> I It's really one of my absolute most favorite things in the entire world is standing under a blooming linden tree. You know, fragrance, again, imprinted on your mind, how important are flowers and our honeybees, and of course, fragrance just to us as we enjoy the yards and gardens. Today's word of the day is apricity. Apricity. I love that word, have for years. Apricity 
is the warmth of the sun in winter as we dream of fragrant flowers. Oh, that's lovely. I, I think we're having a bit of that today, although mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't feel very wintry either. <laughs> so I don't know if that still counts as a pristity. Well, coming up uh, in our next segment, It Makes Sense, we're going to talk about a plant that makes sense. Uh, Stacy will put on trial. Oh, this one. I can all, already smell it. Mm, wonderful. Plants on Trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. If you don't know us already, I'm Stacey Hervella. I'm here with Rick Weiss, and we are here to put a plant on trial. And that means we give you a lot of the details, not all the details. There's not enough time to give all the details. You have to go to the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air.com for those. But we give you the details, and you put it on trial and decide if it's going to be a part of your garden or not. So you and I can be the judge and the jury, but I'm telling you what, folks, it's going to be easy today. (laughs) <laughs> this is a good one, I'll tell you. Uh, today's plant on trial is Centaura Double Blue Lilac. And, mm. you know, talking about fragrance, and Rick suggested fragrance as the topic for today, we have a number of different choices, including one of my absolute favorites that we will no doubt be putting on trial uh, down the line, Simply Sensational Kelly Canthus. Um, but I think lilac is such a classic. And when people think about fragrant, you know, garden, fragrant garden plants, I think lilac is up there for most people, you know. Oh, yeah. No, no question. It's so nostalgic and so powerful and so ephemeral. And I think, you know, most garden scents, I think that's what really is appealing about them. They're ephemeral. They're temporary. Lilacs only bloom for a few weeks, you know, each year. And during that time, you know, again, they fill the air and it's just powerfully associated uh, with that time of year. So Centara Double Blue is today's plant on trial. Lilacs, of course, uh, native to Europe. Is that correct, Stacy? Yes, they okay. are native to Europe and Asia. There are a number of different species of lilac. So when we generally talk about lilac, uh, people are thinking of the common lilac, Syringa vulgaris. And vulgaris there just means that vulgaris. it's common. What Not is that there's that? something, it just means common in Latin. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean the way vulgar is used in English nowadays. Um, so don't let the name deter you. Um, but that's the most common one. But there are a number number of different species of lilacs found around the globe, including tree lilac, yes. Syringa reticulata, um, which is one that doesn't really get a lot of attention, and we're not going there today, but that's another one. But Centaura double blue is a Syringa hyacinthiflora. That says everything. Right? Because right? hyacinth is, ab- is now yeah. it doesn't smell like hyacinth. It smells like a lilac. Mm-hmm. Um, but the flowers do kind of resemble a hyacinth because they are very densely packed into a cluster. And in the case of Centaura double blue, they are actually a, a double flower. So they, they can, I think, with a bit of imagination, uh, remind one of a hyacinth. Um, but yes, native to Europe. And uh, we don't have any native syringas here in the U.S. Yeah, I like lilacs, uh, Stacy, because, uh, you know, I love history, especially American history. And I think about the people who came across on the boats and in the 1700s and had cuttings wrapped in burlap and wet straw, and then they planted them prolifically along the, uh, the East Coast. As a matter of fact, uh, the horticulturist John Bartram at one point was complaining that they were being overplanted. Really? Yeah. Even back in the 1700s? Even in the 1700s. That's that's wild. But that just goes to show you what a beloved plant it really is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that that legacy um, exists today because uh, I think one of the things that I really want people to understand about Centaura double blue lilac and really all lilacs is they are very, very easy to grow. They're extremely durable plants. And that's not what you'd expect from such a delicate and unique scent. But, you know, anyone who lives here in the Midwest can tell you a drive down some old country road uh, on a May day and you're surely going to find lilacs on old abandoned farmsteads. Exactly. You only know it's an old abandoned farmstead because there's a lilac and a collapsed chimney or oh, foundation of a barn or something there like that. There is a theory on that, though, uh, Stacy, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but if you read about it, there is a theory, and that is that uh, back then they did not, in these old homesteads, did not have indoor plumbing. Right. So they would plant the lilacs around the outhouse, and then when the hole was, let's call it full, they dig another hole and plant another lilac. That's the theory. Well, and that very well may be true. I was thinking about that, but 
On the other hand, as far as odor control goes, a lilac is only effective for, for about 10 <laughs> days in May. So I think, you know, maybe some lindens, lavender, some other some other things are going to be in order. But really, these farmsteads, they're long abandoned. And the lilacs are still growing because they really, really are yes. that durable and that easy to grow. Well, Stacy, cold Hardy is the key here, right? Well, you've got that because so many people who grow up in cold climates, you know, think that lilacs are just this plant that everyone can grow and it's ubiquitous, but lilacs are actually not very heat tolerant. And mm -hmm. if I had, you know, a dollar for every gardener who's ever written me and said, I live in California, can I grow a lilac? I live in Texas. I grew up in Michigan and I want to grow lilacs down here. And it breaks my heart to say generally no, because lilac actually need a, a, a number of hours of chilling in order to bloom properly. Right. Um, so we've been talking about fruit the last couple of weeks. We've had some questions from listeners on fruit and chilling hours. Lilacs are like that. They actually need more chilling. Um, and so therefore, in a very mild climate, they aren't getting enough chilling hours to actually flower uh, properly. And so Centara Double Blue as a Syringa Hyacinthiflora is what's known as a low chill lilac. Okay. So even though it's hardy all the way down to USDA zone two, which is wow. really cold. That's cool. Uh, it's actually heat tolerant through USDA zone eight. And that's something that's fairly unusual for most lilacs. So it needs fewer of those chilling hours in order to bloom. So good news. I know we've got listeners from all over the country, including many in warm climates. So if you are in USDA zone eight, Centara uh, double blue and its companion Centara pura, which we'll talk about another day, um, are two great choices for you to potentially get that lilac scent back in your life. I love that. You already have me sold, Stacy. but let me ask you this question. Let me get back to the Syringa vulgaris. <laughs> Those things uh, have a tendency to get kind of rangy, woody, leggy, and then we rejuvenate them by pruning them back. Right. What about this plant? So this is one that definitely, you know, as it matures, it's going to get to be about six to eight feet tall okay. and wide. So it is a large, old-fashioned style of plant. Uh, it is a good idea to remove some of the oldest wood every couple of years once it's mature. So don't have to worry about that while it's newly planted. But as it does start to mature, you know, I've, I have a friend who has um, some wonderful lilacs in his yard, an older house built in like the 1910s. And, you know, because the lilacs weren't pruned or didn't have the oldest wood removed, he's lost some of them because the wood just gotten so old that even though it was alive on top, that old, old stem, it just kind of rots out. So it is a good idea to, you know, every, you know, three to five years after it is established, get your loppers out and take out some of those oldest stems to just keep that new fresh growth, which keeps the plant really healthy and vigorous. Stacy, and with lilac centara, um, sunshine is going to be important. Isn't sunshine important for all lilacs? Because you mentioned the homestead lilacs and eventually a shade tree grows right. and shades them out and they don't bloom as well. Probably yes. So important. sun is crucial. Yeah. Uh, all lilacs are sun lovers. We're talking at least six hours of sun every day. So, you know, even if you live in a hot climate and you're thinking, well, maybe if I grow it in some shade, it will do well. Again, that's not the issue in your climate. The issue is that it's too, you don't get enough chilling hours for the plant to actually bloom. So even if you live in a hot climate, some shade during the absolute hottest part of the day is going to be a good idea, but you're going to want to have at least six hours of sun, ideally in the morning. And if you don't, what's going to happen? You're not going to get good flowering. The fragrance won't be as powerful. The color of the blooms will be muddy if they do in fact appear. And even when you do have an improved variety like Centara, you can get powdery mildew and other uh, foliage diseases that lilacs are really susceptible to. Powdery mildew? That is, you know, a lot less likely to occur yeah. in a full sun. Now, if you want to kill a lilac, I've got a solution <laughs> for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the way to kill a lilac, whether you want to or not, is too much water. Mm. Lilacs absolutely positively cannot stand wet soils. Uh, and I have seen a lot of lilacs die this way, newly planted lilacs, because people get them and then, you know, they, they think, oh, I'm going to do something really good. I'm going to put a bunch of nice, soft potting mix into this hole where I'm planting my new lilac. And that creates a bathtub effect. And there goes your lilac. Lilacs are extremely sensitive to this. So well-drained soils only 
Make sure it's never wet for any period of time because, you know, it's just a, a feature that they have. They just do not do well with wet soils. Like I said, you have to have a sense of humor. And what I lilac in humor, I make up for with puns, right? <laughs> I'm thinking we're going to need a fragrance show part two. There's so much here. Uh, there is so much to talk about. Yeah. And I, I didn't even get to share like all my <laughs> lilac fun facts that I had all dialed up. So if you want those, you're going to have to go to the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. Get the whole story. See pictures of Centaur double blue lilac and how beautiful those flowers are. Unfortunately, uh, the internet does not yet have a scratch and sniff. Mm. So you're going to have to visit a local garden center to smell it yourself. If indeed you do want to add it to your garden this spring and we certainly hope that you do coming up next we're going to be opening up the garden mailbag with your questions so please stay tuned Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. One of the ways we simplify gardening for you on this very show is by helping you with your garden questions. And we've been getting a lot of them, and we appreciate you reaching out with those. And I'm sure as the season gets going, we're going to get a lot more. If you have a gardening question for us, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and just click the contact tab. Or if you'd prefer, just email us, help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. That'll go into our inbox and we'll add you to the list of questions because chances are, you know, when you have a question, just like they told you in elementary school, no someone question. else probably has the same question. <laughs> That's how this show <laughs> works. You betcha. Hey, Stacy, uh, right off the bat, Mandy sends a question. When will you share your theory on monstera leaves you talked about? That was last week when we talked about houseplants. I love philodendrons and I don't want to miss it. Okay, so Stacy, I have a theory. Now, uh, monsteras are those house plants, those iconic house plants that have slits or holes in them. Yep. And people will ask people like us, why do these leaves have holes in them? Swiss cheese plants. And uh, we had said that with some people, they theorize that, well, it's because of hurricanes and the wind will be able to blow through the foliage. And I think that that's ridiculous because then all leaves would have holes and slits. My theory is this, Stacy, that with Monstera, it is a plant that grows in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. And because it grows in the rainforest up into the tops of the trees, I consider it a benevolent plant. In other words, the plant has holes and slits to allow sunlight through instinctively to benefit the leaves on the ground floor or the leaves along the stem of that monstera. So I say it's because monsteras are benevolent and I'm sticking with my theory. Well, you're, you have a right to your theory. Uh, you know, I often say plants don't get enough credit for X, Y, and Z. But in this case, Rick, I, I'm afraid you might be giving them a little too much credit. Uh, <laughs> plants that we know of are not, uh, they, they aren't capable of deciding if they're going to do favors for their neighbors or not. But it is, I don't think you're entirely on the wrong track because I, you know me, I've got to go and find a scientific explanation. Sure. Uh, so I did, I, I went and I searched uh, leaf fenestration, which is the technical term for this phenomenon, and found an interesting study that, of course, I'll link in the show notes. Uh, this is an actual uh, academic study that happened. Uh, they did this in the uh, Monteverde rainforest in Costa Rica, and they tested three hypotheses, whether this, was these, this adaptation was for water uptake, wind damage reduction, and herbivory deterrence. So basically do, Ooh, do things work. that eat plants say, oh, there's not as much there, that, that leaf doesn't look as appetizing. Is that what it is? And they unequivocally <laughs> proved <laughs> The that buffet's been picked over. Okay. <laughs> exactly. All yeah. right. Uh, they unequivocally proved that it is actually for water uptake. Okay. That the plants uh, that, that have it take up more water and are therefore healthier. But here's where your theory comes in. Those holes are allowing more water to go down, reach the ground instead of just sitting on the leaf where it's going to get, you know, drank by a bird or a sloth or something like that. Um, by uh, pushing more water down to the ground, that would also encourage other growth, which could then grow over the roots of the monstera as a kind of living mulch That's plausible. and help it be more healthy. So Plausible. I don't know if it made a decision to be benef to be benevolent, but you know, this is how things sort of evolve together is uh works out well for everybody and that's how we, you know, end up where we are. So hey, this is plants on trial part two, I guess. <laughs> uh my good friend uh Phil Odendron, I think he's benevolent, so I'm gonna stick with that. 
All right. Uh, let's see. Dave sends us uh, a note. I'm going to let you answer this one, <laughs> Stacy. Does the Gardening Simplified show make house calls? Oh, my goodness. Imagine if we did. We, oh. we could have our own car with a, a big logo on it and, and some sirens, some green sirens, so everybody would make way when we were coming down the street. I'm thinking helicopter myself. <laughs> Are we going to, like, jump out on yeah. ropes, James yeah, Bond style? I like it. Uh, no, unfortunately, we don't really make house calls, but we can help you, absolutely. And, you know, I think what one of the best things about helping people garden is the advent of the digital camera. Because even when I started yeah. here 12 years ago, people would write to us with their problems and they didn't have digital cameras and now everybody's got a smartphone. Um, so if you can send us pictures now, it's really hard, I think, to help people when they say, hey, design my landscape. We can't really do that. But if you're having problems with your plants or you need a couple of plant suggestions, please don't hesitate to write us. We can't visit your house. Uh, we do have other things going on in our lives, not least of all our own garden. Um, but we're always happy to help and share our knowledge. Well, and of course, we have the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and we try to keep you composted there and uh, posted, not composted. And <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, yeah, everyone has a smartphone, and we try to give you a smart answer uh, weekly. So thank you very much, Dave, for your question. You might receive this question from Proven Winners because they had submitted it already, but the Perfecta Mundo Pink Carpet Azalea. Can it take Texas Full Sun Zone 8A? A YouTube show indicated that if it could take Florida Sun, then it could take your sun. Well, I don't know about Texas Sun, especially in summer. Oh, wow. Well, you know, the answer, uh, as with so many things in horticulture, is it depends. Uh ah, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on a number of things. So, um, so Perfectimundo Pink Carpet is uh, a reblooming azalea. Now, the Perfectimundo series of azaleas was developed in North Carolina by Dr. Tom Rainey. And uh, we have it as hardy to USDA zone 6B. So here in West Michigan, it's done okay for us in some years, particularly if we have a lot of snow cover. But it really does better in more mild zone 6Bs that don't have the length of cold that we have. So in zone eight, yes, in theory, they should perform very, very well. But the depends part comes uh, on your actual environment. Do you have irrigation? Mm. Um, and that, especially in hotter climates like yours, and especially if it's a drier part of Texas, that really is the crucial factor between a plant being able to survive in more sun or not. Because, you know, the sunnier and hotter it is, the more water the plant is using. And without regular replenishment of that, sure. you know, it's it's not going to do well. So, um, again, Tom did not mention which part of Texas uh, it is. He said last year they had 45 days of 100 to 110 degree temperature. Sounds like your kind of place. There. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. By the way, those azaleas probably could use a dose of, of mulch, too. I mean, yes. you know, we often think about the heat stress on the foliage of the plant, but, uh, boy, when the ground heats up, you can help keep the ground a little cooler with a, a good dose of mulch. Uh, you know, in hot climates, you really can't say enough about mulch. It is the gardener's best friend, even if you do have irrigation, because then that's helping your irrigation last even longer and go even farther. And there are plants that I think mulch, no matter what climate you're in, is truly crucial for, for and that is shallow-rooted plants. Mm -hmm. And azalea definitely qualifies as one of those. It has a shallow, fibrous root root system. And so what that means is any extreme heat in that top layer of soil, any extreme dryness in that top layer of soil, the azalea is really going to take that badly. Now, if you yeah. do have a spot where they could get some afternoon shade just during that hottest part of the day, I'm sure they and you would appreciate that. But I say if you have uh, regular irrigation, if you have acidic soil, because no azalea is going to be happy without acidic soil, and uh, and you can mulch, I'd say you have a pretty good shot at them doing very well. Yeah, I think so too. I agree. And as far as the mulch aspect is concerned, you know, again, a reminder that it's not just for decorative 
purposes. And, and, you know, an analogy I could make here is our turf in the heat of summer. Part of the reason we raise the deck on the mower and allow the turf to be longer in summer is because it helps shade the crown of the plant, cool the soil, and it'll, it helps the turf get through those hot summer months. So yeah, great advice. And, you know, when we talk about mulch, particularly for rhododendrons, azaleas, any of these shallow rooted plants, we're talking about an organic mulch, something that will decompose. Yes. So not a rock mulch. Yes. You will have a very unhappy azalea if you try to put a rock mulch on it in Texas. So definitely looking at pine straw, shredded bark, any of those kinds of things. And then because Perfectimundo Pink Carpet is a ground covering azalea, eventually when it does what you want it to do, which is to, to create that pink carpet, you'll need a lot less mulch because just like you said with the turf, the plant is shading itself out and kind of taking care of itself. But the trick is getting it to that point in the first place. In this case, don't rock on, right? <laughs> don't rock on. No, okay. not when it comes to mulch. Yeah. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to have a, a guest interview. And it's going to be about planning for canning. Hey. You won't want to miss that. So please stay tuned. Welcome back, my friends, to the Gardening Simplified Show. Today in Branching News, we're going to talk to the canning diva, Diane Devereaux. She is the canning diva. You can learn more about her at canningdiva.com. Com, and uh, she's written some great books. I've used her books, Beginner's Guide to Canning, Complete Guide to Pressure Cooking. Boy, I needed that because that's not the kind of pressure we're talking about. But Complete Guide to Pressure Cooking and Canning Full Circle from Garden to Jar to Table. Diane, welcome to the Gardening Simplified Show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. And, you know, Stacy and I were talking about this, and Stacy came up with this great idea, planning for canning. I love that. Well, that's what you do I in the winter. It. You plan. <laughs> yes, I love it. So how do we do our planning? Where do we have to start? I mean, obviously, uh, referencing a book like yours or your website is very helpful. As a matter of fact, Diane, you'd be You'd be uh, proud of me. I made dilly beans this past fall, cucumbers, uh, all based on, on your recipes. I followed step by step, and even I could do it. Nice. I'm so proud of you. Good job, Rick. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's fun once you get started, and, then, and, and once you start making delicious recipes, you see them so beautiful sitting on your pantry shelf. You are diving back either into my books or on my website trying to find more cool things you can put into jars. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of you. But yeah, planning for canning is, is awesome because right now, especially with all the sunshine coming out, I mean, we are all chomping at the bit <laughs> for the snow to be gone. And um, many of us get catalogs, seed catalogs in the mail. The, the way I tell individuals to do it is I, I, like I have a downloadable PDF on my website at canningdiva.com. I give everyone um, fruits and vegetables that come into fruition and harvest in our state. And so you can use that side by side with your calendar. And as you're planning to either grow or shop, you know, at your local farmer's market, you can start mapping out what that looks like each month and build your canning calendar around that coinciding with, you know, different recipes. So I think, you know, one of the biggest issues with canning, like I'm limited, I live in a city lot. Um, I would love to have, you know, a one acre vegetable garden. I say that now, but of course, ask me in July. Um, and, and, you know, how, when you're someone like me who is limited on space, but you do want to have enough produce that you can can and enjoy in the off season, you know, how do you recommend kind of balancing out the quantities so that you have some to eat fresh in season when everything's at its height, as well as ways to extend the harvest. Those are some hard decisions. They are. And what it comes down to is space and time, right? If your kitchen is small, or your home is small, or as you said, your lot is small, it, it can really come down to what you're able to produce and how much time you can invest in it. But the beauty you have is available farmers markets. And so they're the ones that have those acreages. And they can come to, you know, your local area and you can buy at a reasonable price fresh produce and even get to know the farmer, right? So grow what you can. Usually what happens in smaller lots, individuals are growing in containers. 
and they are just producing either enough for them to consume with their meals fresh, or they might focus on one particular vegetable because that's what they want to put up in a jar. So for someone with a small amount of space, tomatoes are usually what everyone will gravitate towards. And you can have several container gardens going in a very small amount of space. And now you're growing upwards and you can then have enough to where when you're now in your kitchen, you're preserving something you know you're going to use. So I I would always tell everyone and I want all of your listeners, start with what you consume. Take Take a mental inventory of how you eat. You know, what meals are you preparing uh, what is a common theme that you're seeing? And then from there, you then can choose the vegetable or the fruit, and it starts to be your guide. Yeah, I love that. We are talking to the canning diva, Diane Devereaux. Diane, do I have this correct? When you and I have chatted before, you grew up on a farm in, in northern Michigan and originally had a career in disaster management. So food preservation is kind of natural to you, right? I would say so. Yes, I grew up in my younger years in the city. So I get it when Stacy's like, I have a smaller place and I, you know, the lot is small. That's where we grew up until I was 13. And we moved to northern Michigan and I lived on a hog farm. Um, We had a two acre garden. I mean, we really, um, yeah, we lived it and breathed it and canning was just part of our existence. It was a way of life. And then, yes, as I uh, wrapped up college, I got into disaster management and I traveled, well, the globe. Um, disaster hopping is the term we often call it. And, um, you know, having small children, I needed to be at home. And so the career was amazing, but I had to change the way in which I utilize these skills. So I created the Canning Diva to keep me home and to take a passion and, and, and something that I'm really, you know, involved in and make it into a business and teach others. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, as one canner said to another, let's talk while we can. So I have the <laughs> same issue Stacy does. I have a small lot, and every year in spring, uh, I plant too many tomatoes or cucumbers okay. or zucchini. Those are the three mm-hmm. primary ones where in August, September, I end up bagging them up, putting them on a neighbor's front step, ringing the doorbell, and running. So... <laughs> Uh, is there an easy way to preserve these, bag them, freeze them in fall, or do I have to be careful about the number that I plant? No, I think you should keep planting what you've been doing because that's the beauty of food preservation. Freezing is a method of food preservation. It just doesn't give us the length of time that many of us want to see. So, my advice would be to start learning how to preserve it into jars. And that's where water bathing and pressure canning come into play. Cucumbers can be made into pickles. Zucchini can be preserved using a pressure canner. Tomatoes are probably the most versatile vegetable or fruit used um, in a lot of different recipes. So taking the time to educate yourself um, on how to, how to water bathe or pressure can will make sure that you're now putting all of that food up. And st- I mean, you can still share with your neighbors, but now it's not an obligation because you have more than what you know what to do with. <laughs> now it's, it's because, you know, you have that extra left over or you might be gifting them jars. That's also a huge thing that a lot of us canners do. So what is your must have? Like, say you're in, you know, Rick and ours, my situation where you have limited space and you're only going to be able to grow, say, one or two crops to make your favorite canning recipes. I'm wondering what those, are, what your absolute must have ride or die canning recipe is. Okay. My ride or die must have would be my basil diced tomatoes. Mm. And I use that in a lot of recipes. It is the foundation for a lot of things like chilies and soups and stews, spaghetti. I can even, I can use it in so many different things. Um, It's simple. It's tomatoes. You use a bit of your sweeter bell peppers, uh, onions, garlic, fresh basil leaves. And so the reason I say this is the one to gravitate to, number one, it is so versatile, whereas stewed tomatoes have a very pungent, you know, green pepper flavor. So it limits you. Basil diced tomatoes is far more versatile. And then number two, for those individuals wanting to learn how to pressure can, it's a, it's a simple, easy recipe to start. It only needs to pressure can for 15 minutes. And that's about 
all a new canner can handle, especially if they're by themselves in their kitchen. Um, it just gives them that really good, easy recipe to start with before they, before they work their way into far more complicated recipes. Wow, that's fantastic. And I love basil. I mean, just oh, yeah. the, you know, we were talking about fragrance earlier in the show, and I love basil. I call it basil instinct. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mm-hmm. think that if you plant basil around tomato plants, it makes the tomatoes taste better. But again, that's just a theory on my part, and it's not backed. <laughs> By scientific Well, it can evidence. hurt. It can hurt. They're a match made in heaven in the kitchen, in the can, and uh, and we'll let it slide in the garden. Can't argue with it. Well, Stacy's exactly. uh, Stacy's comment: planning for canning, uh, Diane. You probably think that's pretty smart. That this is the time of year we should be doing our planning. I agree. It's it's brilliant, and it is the time in which we want to start mapping things out. It helps us even you know, know what to grow. Um, I even tell individuals, you know, if you're not going to eat it, don't can it. So if you're not going to can it, don't grow it. And so this is the perfect time to really start mapping out your garden and coincide that plan with your, your canning calendar. Well, make sure to check our note, our show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. Her name is Diane Devereaux. She is the canning diva canning diva.com. She also has a podcast canning with the diva. And we're going to put all that information there on our show notes, gardening simplified on air.com. Diane, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. Have yourselves a great week, folks. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Rick.